hunch that some of this is related to a comment you made just in passing last night, which is the grand narrative of the Enlightenment and the grand narrative of Christianity are in conflict. Mm -hmm. Can you say a little bit more about that, about how the grand narrative of the Enlightenment, you said, you know, reached its climax mm -hmm. in, the in the 19th century, 18th century, 18th century mm -hmm. and obviously uh, Christianity mm -hmm. in the cross. Mm -hmm. How do you see those narratives working themselves out and how do we, how can we approach that and talk about that? Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating. I'm not a modern historian and I tend to check things out when, with people who are, but uh, gradually over the years I've acquired a, more of a sense of what was going on in, in European and North American philosophy, political philosophy, etc., through the 18th and 19th century. And obviously there's a lot to do with people being fed up with the wars of religion that characterized the post-Reformation world in Europe. And wanting space, wanting not to have to fight each other about precise dogmas, or at least n not to use those precise dogmas as excuses for fighting each other, however you want to put that. But then simultaneously with that, you've got the rise of modern science, and you've also got, which was as cataclysmic to them as September the 11th, 2001 was for us, the Lisbon earthquake in 1755, which just posed such a sharp question to the easygoing, I don't even know what word to use, but kind of natural theology of the first half of the 18th century, where, you know, Joseph Butler, analogy of religion and so on, the sort of sense that if this was actually a world where you could have a major earthquake on All Saints Day when all the churches are full, so that the churches are collapsing on people who ex hypothesize are devout Christians, and then those who escape rush down to the harbor to get away from the falling buildings, and they see this great sight that the sea has fled and run away, and they wonder if it's the end of the world. And the answer is it nearly is, because it's a tsunami following the earthquake, and it comes back, and the people who are escaping from the buildings are drowned by the returning tidal wave. And you know, easygoing, vaguely Christian Europe, that had said that basically God's in his heaven and all is right with the world and it's, it's all working out okay, suddenly faces the shock that this world is a very uncomfortable and unpredictable and unpleasant place and how do you navigate that? And so all, all these things drive the separation of God and the world so that it, it fuels a deism and Epicureanism, etc. But that coincides politically with what you've got going on in France with the French Revolution which is as much an anti-Catholic as an anti-aristocratic revolution, and in America with the American Revolution, which is, of course, as much an anti-British revolution as, as it's anything else. And uh, all these things come rushing together, and those who feel themselves to be at the cutting edge say, we are entering a new age. Have any of you read one of your own dollar bills recently? Do you know what it says on the dollar bill? Where is it? Not worth as much as it was a while ago. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's, that's, that's our currency, actually. On the back of your dollar bill, along with In God We Trust, Anuit Capetis Novus Ordo Seclorum, a new order of the ages. You know where that's a quote from? Virgil. And what is Virgil talking about? The new age which is born when Augustus became emperor. Who commanded that to be put on your dollar bill? My guess is Thomas Jefferson. And uh, hang on, is this right? It's 1876? What's, no, so 1776. 1776. Uh, it kind of was, yeah. so, 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 I'm, so I'm told. But, but you know, I, I, I bear that no ill will. We have, we have a penny coin with Britannia ruling the waves, which, which is a joke because she did that a couple hundred years ago, she probably doesn't do it too much anymore, especially when our submarines collide with French submarines under the... What is that about? I mean, it's just... The Atlantic Ocean's a big place. I mean, too little... Well, anyway. Um, so, what I'm saying... Is, and, and Novus Ordo Seclorum, that, that's, that's, that's one of the key markers of the Enlightenment, and it's quite literally written into your coinage, your monetary system. You know, good luck to you. Um, uh, and, and the French likewise, the sort of belief that now that we'd got universal adult suffrage, voting, everybody votes, utopia is just around the corner. 
And, you know, you Americans did that and, and it seemed to work and so you, it's why you're all so happy. And the French did it and it hasn't seemed to work, it's why they're all so miserable. I mean, it's, a, it's very, very odd. And we Brits look from the one to the other and think, what is going on here? This is, anyway. But that narrative says a new order of the ages, a new saculum, a new way of being has emerged and it's us. That's why I say it's, it's inherently gnostic. It's we are the enlightened ones. We have discovered the key to the world. And the imperative then is to be true to that, to live it out, to follow the dictates, the imperatives of that, whether it's the, you know, the enlightenment way of life, the American way of life, or whatever. And that becomes the master narrative that people are going through in their heads. And anything else that gets in the way is, is ruled out. And you can have Christian versions of that where you fit Christianity into that. But basically what you're doing is taking those elements of Christianity that will fit and ignoring the ones that won't. So that's, that's, that's how it works. And that's why I say, people often say that it's because of the rise of modern science that we can't believe in the resurrection anymore. Now that's utterly, utterly ridiculous. You know, Aeschylus knew that the resurrection doesn't happen. Um, Plato, Pliny, Homer knew that resurrection doesn't happen. Everybody knows that doesn't happen. It didn't take modern science to discover that once you bury people, they, they tend to stay dead. Um, the, the point is that resurrection cannot be allowed within this worldview because if Jesus really rose bodily from the dead, then that's when history turned its key corner, not in the 18th century. And so, you know, unmasking the rhetoric of the Enlightenment, I think, is absolutely crucial. That's why postmodernity is so important. Uh, I know that there's deep suspicion among many conservative Christians in North America about postmodernity. And I, I want to say, some of you have heard me say this before, postmodernity is about announcing the doctrine of the fall to arrogant modernity. That was necessary, but the doctrine of the fall is never the last word. And the task of the church today could be summed up as how, granted postmodernity has been preaching the fall, not always doing it exactly accurately, but more or less, how do we now announce the, appropriately the doctrine of redemption, which is not a return to a chastened modernity, but a going through and out into somewhere else that we ain't got to yet. And I find that hugely exciting. What a wonderful agenda to set ourselves.